Hello and welcome to the session in which we will discuss basic earnings per share or basic EPS. What's the big idea for earnings per share? Well, earnings per share is a theoretical number. It shows you how much income is earned per share. So let me show you a simple example. When a company operates, they generate revenues minus expenses, keeping everything simple and they get to net income. Now there's more steps to this, but I'm keeping it simple. Let's assume revenues was 100,000, expenses were 40,000, net income was 60,000. Now what we do is we'll take net income theoretically, earnings, so we call net income as earnings, and we'll divide net income by how many shares are outstanding, average share outstanding. We'll see how we compute this. And let's assume for the sake of this illustration, we have six, 120,000. Therefore, we say EPS is 50 cent per share. It means if we distribute all the 60,000 to the 120,000 shares, each share will earn 50 pennies. And this is called basic. And why are we emphasizing the word basic? We're emphasizing the word basic earnings per share. We're going to have basic and we're going to have diluted. We'll talk about that later. Now, bear in mind, as I said, this is a theoretical. It doesn't mean the company will distribute the whole 60,000. Whatever they distribute is called dividend. So of that 60,000, if they distribute 20,000, that's called dividend what's distributed and the remainder 40,000 is what the company keeps and we call this re we cap we keep it in an account called retained earnings what's good about basic earnings per share or earnings per share it's comparable from year to year so if you want to see how well you are doing as a shareholder you can compare how much that did i earn last year compared to this year or i can compare company A earnings per share to company B. So those are comparable. Although company A is a billion dollar company, company B is a million dollar company, they are comparable. Once you compute earnings per share, it's basically factoring the size out and looking at the company earnings per share per earnings per share. So simply put, if a company is is having an earnings per share of 50 cent and another one earnings per share is 0 0.75 0 0.75 0 0.75 is higher so it's you can compare it on the same level it required to be disclosed on the face of the financial statement and we have to compute earnings per share for continuing as well as discontinuing operations simply put when we publish financial statements specifically for publicly traded companies earnings per share is disclosed either on the face right right inside the financial statements or close by that we can see that's what we mean by the face of the financial statement it's the most widely quoted ratio in the real world so if you listen to cnbc if you follow the wall street journal earnings per share is constantly quoted in determining the value of the company now let's take a look at a simple illustration let's assume net income for a company and i'm going to be a little bit more specific here i'm going to say net income applicable to common shareholders 400,000 why did i add this you know common to shareholder because we might have preferred stock and preferred stock might get preferred dividend so if there's any preferred dividend involved we have to deduct the preferred dividend simply put if a company has a preferred stock and they 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 declare preferred dividend we have to deduct preferred dividend if the preferred dividend is cumulative we also have to deduct the cumulative and we spoke we talked about this in a, in a prior session but we will see this in an example shortly and the total number of shares is a million so we can compute basic earnings per share and I, again I'm emphasizing the word basic which is 400,000 dividing the 400,000 among the 1 million shares each share will earn 40 pennies now again why am I emphasizing the word basic earnings per share because we have to differentiate between two type of capital structure simple and complex simple capital structure is when we compute basic earnings per share simple and basic they're together so when do we know whether we have a simple capital structure or a complex capital structure capital structure is how you raise your money your capital if you have simple capital structure it means you have no what we call dilutive securities if you have no dilutive securities and i hope you remember what the dilutive securities are because we spent two to three sessions actually three sessions on dilutive securities those are convertible bonds convertible preferred stock stock options stock warrants why do we call them dilutive 
Simply put, we call them dilutive because if exercise, if converted, so if the convertible bonds, because convertible bonds can convert their bonds into stocks, if they convert, the denominator will go up. If we have more shares, this earnings per share could go down. Same thing with convertible prefer. It's going to increase the denominator. Same thing with stock options. Again, they are potentially dilutive. Sometimes they may not be dilutive. Don't worry, we'll work an example illustrating this concept shortly. But the point is to have a simple capital structure, it means you have no dilutive securities. The only securities you have is common stock. That's the only thing that you have. Now, what is dilutive? Simply put, I'll, I'll give you an example. For example, I'm going to talk about my wife here. My wife, when we buy orange juice or when we buy iced tea, she always add water to her cup. I don't add water to mine. So she dilute the sugar effect. So for example, when I drink two cups of orange juice, my wife might drink five cups of orange juice, given the same given the same volume. Why? Because she dilute her orange juice. So when you dilute it, the, the, the value of the juice goes down because you're adding more water. Same concept applies to earnings per share. When you add more common stock to the denominator, earnings per share will go down. Now, what is a complex capital structure? This is when we compute diluted earnings per share. How do we know do we have a complex capital structure? Well, we have dilutive securities. What are the dilutive securities? Right there, convertible bonds, convertible preferred stock, stock options, stock warrant, so on and so forth. And those are potentially potentially dilutive. They potentially decrease earnings per share. So we're going to see in an example, what does that mean? What does that mean by being potentially dilutive? Before we proceed any further, I have a public announcement about my company, FarhatLectures.com. Farhat Accounting Lectures is a supplemental educational tool that's going to help you with your CPA exam preparation as well as your accounting courses. My CPA material is aligned with your CPA review course such as Becker, Roger, Wiley, Gleam, Miles. My accounting courses are aligned with your accounting courses broken down by chapter and topics. My resources consist of lectures, multiple choice questions, true-false questions, as well as exercises. Go ahead, start your free trial today. So let's dive a little bit more into the formula for basic earnings per share. Specifically, let's see the official formula is net income minus preferred dividend. And we'll talk about the preferred dividend, when do we deduct it and when we ignore that, divided by the weighted average number of shares. So that's the formula. Let's look at the denominator first. Well, net income is pretty straightforward. Net income is net income. Then we have to deduct preferred dividend. When do we deduct preferred dividend? So listen to me carefully. If preferred dividend is cumulative, you always deduct whether it's declared or not. So if in the problem they say we have preferred dividend and that preferred dividend is cumulative, guess what? You don't have to wait whether to find out whether the company declared the preferred dividend or not. Once it's cumulative, it's deductible. So it's net income minus preferred dividend if it's cumulative. If, if, if it's non-cumulative, they have to tell you it was declared because non-cumulative, you don't deduct. Why? Because if it's cumulative, you owe the dividend, whether you declared it or not. That's why you deduct it. And when you're computing the EPS, you only deduct one year of dividend because in the prior year, whether it was declared or not, you deducted. And two years ago, whether it's declared or not, you deducted. So you deduct only one year of dividend if it's a cumulative. If it's non-cumulative, you only deduct when it is declared. In the denominator, we must weigh the shares by the fraction of the period outstanding. What does that mean? Well, the best way is to look at an example to see how this works. Let's assume the company started January 1st when they have 100,000 shares. So let's take a look at a timeline here. Maybe it's a good way to look at this. January 1st, they started with 100,000 shares. So they started with 100,000 shares. And they had 100,000 shares up until March 1st. So from January 1st, I'm going to say this is March 1st. March 1st, they added, issued 30,000 new shares. So they had 100,000 shares for this period. What do we have to do for this period? We have to prorate it. So this is 100,000 shares times 212 of a year. On March 1st, 3-1, they issued 30,000 shares. Now, starting on March 1st, they had 130,000 shares all the way till July. So from uh, March 1st till July, they had 130,000 shares. Again, we have to prorate this 
it's all of March, all of April, May, and June. We have four months. Therefore, we'll take 130,000 times 412. Then on July 1st, they purchased 39,000 shares. What does that mean? It means the company bought back, bought back. They purchased on this date, they purchased 39,000 shares. It means starting July 1st, they had 91,000 shares. And they had 91,000 9, shares from July till November. So this is November. So this period they had they had 91,000 shares. Again, we have to prorate this period. They only had it for July, August, September, and October. So 4 divided by 12 times 4 divided by 12. Then they issued 60,000 shares. Then we add 60,000 shares, and that's going to give us 161,000 shares. And they had 161,000 shares from November till December. Again, that's 161,000 shares times 212 of the year. What we do now is we add all these figures to find, to find the weighted average number of shares. We end up with 161, but that's not the answer. So this is what we do. This is what I just did. 100,000 times 212. 130,000 times 412. 91,000 times 412. 161 times 212. No, I'm sorry. I didn't say 912. 212, 412, 412, and 212. Now remember, it has to add up to 12 months. Notice 2 plus 4, 6 plus 4, 10 plus 4, 12, 12. And hopefully my math is right. If my math is right, the weighted average number of shares is 117, 165. Notice they end up with 161,000 shares. However, the weighted average is only 117,165. Now also what's going to be involved in those computation is uh, sometimes we might have dividends, sometimes we might have what's called a stock split. So we have to make certain adjustment. Let's switch the scenario a little bit and work with stock split and dividend. We started the year with 100,000 shares. On March 1st, we issued 30,000 shares. On May 1st, we declared a 10% dividend. 10%, we had 130,000 shares outstanding. 10% is we're going to add 13,000 shares. When we declare stock dividend, or stock split, it applies to all previously issued shares. The previously issued shares are 130,000 shares. On July 1st, we purchased 39,000 shares. So we went from, we deduct 39. Now we're at 104. Then we issued an additional 70, um, we issued an additional 70,000 shares, not 60, 70. We're up to 174. And the last day of the year, December 31st, we did a stock split 241. For every one share, we double the number of shares. Well, when that happens, what do we have to do? The stock split will apply to all previously outstanding shares. So we end up a number of shares, 348,000. Now, how do we compute the weighted average number of shares outstanding? Well, we're going to follow the same formula or the same method that we followed earlier. We're going to take the number of shares outstanding and we're going to prorate them as fraction of the year. For example, the 100,000 shares they were outstanding from January 1st till March 1st, they will be multiplied by 212 of, of a year. March 1st till May 1st, we should have 130,000 shares because we added 30,000 to the 100,000. They're going to be outstanding for 212. Then we declared 10% stock dividend. We added 13,000 shares we end up with 143 and they were outstanding for 212. Now after we go through the proration, at the end of the year, if you remember, we had two for one stock split. Therefore, all the shares prior to December 31st will be subject to the two for one stock split, which is multiplied by two. Also, the other adjustment we need to make is from May 1st, we declared a 10% stock dividend. It means all the shares prior to May 1st. So all the shares prior to May 1st will have to be adjusted by 10%, which is one times 1.1. Now, why 1.1? So if we take 100,000 shares, increase by 10% will give us 10,000 new shares. However, the reason why we multiplied by 1.1 is to take the 100,000 shares times 1.1 equal to 110. This one is the original 100,000, so it will be equal to 2, 110. Therefore, we don't have to go through two steps. Therefore, what we do is we'll take 100,000 shares times the fraction of the year outstanding times the dividend times the stock split, 
and the weighted average for that 100,000 is 36,666. Same thing from May, March till May 1st, we, hundred, we have 130,000 times 212 fraction of the year times they're subject to the 10% stock dividend times the stock split 241 equal to 47,677. Now the remainder of the shares will take the number of shares outstanding times the fraction of the year times 2. Then what we do, we add all these shares up to come up to 259,333 rounded. And this will be the weighted average number of shares outstanding. Now again, don't be surprised if you are only asked to compute the weighted average number of shares outstanding. Because this number, it's going to help you compute what? Compute earnings per share. Now in the real world, which is... you most likely on the CPA exam you will not have to do this but in the real world if they are looking at comparative EPS they have to go back and adjust the prior year uh, shares in order for the earnings per share to be competitive between year one and year two because we had stock split we had a stock dividend just FYI you know it's a little bit more complicated what should you do now you want to go to Farhat lectures look at MCQs additional resources whether you are a CPA candidate accounting student, CMA student, studying for some sort of a professional certification. Invest in yourself. Good luck. Study hard and of course, stay safe.